Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so wonderful to see such a big crowd here um, to hear Dr. Max Eisen speak. Before uh, we begin, I'd like to introduce the president of the Jewish Heritage Center, Mark Cantor, who will bring greetings. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. As president of the Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, I welcome you to this evening's event. It is an honor to have Dr. Eisen, excuse me, Eisner speaking to us this evening. Before he is introduced by Bill, I do ask your indulgence. For those of you who have attended many of our functions before and have heard me talk, I'll probably sound like a broken record, but I just want to talk to you a little bit, just a minute or so, about what we do at the Jewish Heritage Center. We are the umbrella organization for the Marion and Ed Vicker Jewish Museum, the Freeman Family Foundation Holocaust Education Center, the Marvin and Irma Penn Archives, and the Genealogical Institute. In a nutshell, we preserve and promote the Jewish history of Western Canada. I would need the rest of the evening to tell you about all the wonderful programs, events, exhibits that we put on, but I won't do that to you tonight. But with two exceptions, I do want to bring to your attention two uh, programs, events that we have upcoming. I'll note that on May 13, uh, at uh, 7 p.m. at the Sherazetic Synagogue, it's a Monday evening, the next Saul and Florence Caney Distinguished Speaker Series will be held. And we're very excited to have a journalist from the New York Times uh, speaking. Uh, Brett Stevens is his name. He will talk, or at least his topic will be um, the rise of nationalism, populism, and hate. The Saul and Florence Caney lecture series is a major annual fundraising event for us. So I do encourage you to please uh, assist us by either supporting and or um, sponsoring and or purchasing tickets for this event and it'll be a wonderful event. I also want to bring to your attention as a precursor to Brett Stevens lecture on May 13th on March 25 at 7 p.m. here at the Bernie Theatre we have another program nationalism populism and anti-semitism then and now again that's on March 25 at 7 p.m. here at the Bernie Theatre um, it's being put together by writer-director Andrew Wall and, of course, our own Bell Jarneski. Suffice it to say, I am a strong believer that in order to know where we are going, we need to know where we come from. The Jewish Heritage Center preserves our past to ensure our future. I'd like to thank all of you for attending tonight. Please enjoy yourselves, and Bell, I turn it over to you. Thank you. I now have the immense pleasure of introducing Dr. Max Eisen. Uh, before I begin to say a little bit about him, I want to talk about yesterday. Yesterday at the University of Winnipeg, uh, we held our 18th annual Holocaust and Human Rights Symposium, and Max was our speaker. We had nearly a thousand students from 22 different schools, uh, not only in Winnipeg, but outside of Winnipeg, who came to hear him speak. And it was just so wonderful to see these students engaged, listening, and then afterwards asking such insightful questions. And I truly believe that days like yesterday make a change in their lives. It's something that they will always remember and always think about as they continue to grow and develop and the, develop their thought processes as, as well. Max was born in Czechoslovakia in 1929. In fact, the only member of his large Orthodox Jewish family to survive the Holocaust. He survived slave labor in Auschwitz Mauthausen, Melk, and Ebensee camps, and he was forced to go on a death march in January of 1945, where thousands died from exposure to severe weather conditions and lack of food. 
He was liberated from the Ebensee concentration camp in Austria in 1945 as an orphan teenager. After his arrival in Toronto in 1949, he studied English and worked at a variety of jobs before launching his own manufacturing company in 1964. As a first-hand witness and a survivor, Dr. Eisen has been long devoted to educating others about the Holocaust, encouraging understanding and teaching about the dangers of hatred and discrimination in society, which continues to be a very, very worrisome problem today. We are experiencing a resurgence of anti-Semitism, of hate, as I would say not, we have not seen since the end of World War II. Dr. Eisen has received many acknowledgements and awards for his tireless efforts, including an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Trent University. And his award-winning 2016 memoir, By Chance Alone, has been selected as one of five contenders in CBC's Canada Reads. And the book will be for sale, as you may have noticed, just outside in the foyer right after his talk. And Max will be pleased to sign your book. Thank you very much, Max. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is said, uh, without history, there is no memory. And without memory, there is no future. And I'm going to be, my topic tonight is, of course, the Shoah, uh, a catastrophe that started with words. Words are very powerful. And once they are out there, you can never take it back. It takes on a life of its own. It started in Nazi Germany. The Nazis had a supremacist Nazi ideology. Anyone with physical features, racial features, religious beliefs who did not fit in the mold of the mass race were to be simply eliminated from the face of the earth. The Nazis had a Ministry of Propaganda. Dr. Goebbels, the mouthpiece of Hitler, he spewed hatred 24-7. Jews were demonized, dehumanized, and almost everybody got on board and people bought it. And they also had a massive apparatus of deception. And six million Jews were murdered, brutally murdered, by the Nazis, their collaborators, including a million and a half children. Children whose wings were not allowed to spread, whose talents have been lost to the world. I'm sure you all heard or read the diary of Anne Frank. What an amazing teenager she was at 13 years old. She was hiding in an attic in Amsterdam with her family. She was given away by a Dutch person to the Gestapo. They were arrested, sent to Auschwitz. Anne Frank died three weeks before liberation in Bergen Belsen. Had she survived, she would have been 90 years old, the same as I. She would have been a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and even a great grandmother. Imagine how many books she could have written by now. I'm also uh, thinking of a young boy 
But his name was Peter Gins, P-E-T-R, Peter, this is a Slavic way. Peter Gins was born in Prague. He kept a daily diary at the Nazi Center Prague. Peter was a genius. And there's something we had in common. He loved the, the books about Jules Warren. And so did I. I think I was six years old. I read all the books about Jules Warren. Peter Gaines, by the time he was 11 years old, has written four books of how Jules Warren would have written it in the 1940s. <clears throat> Of course, those books were never published. Peter started a newspaper in Terezin in occupied Czechoslovakia. They didn't have a printing press. It was written by hand. And the name of the paper was Vedem, which is a Czech word meaning we lead. He also did sketches in charcoal he did a sketch in 1942. He gave it a name, he gave it a title, Moonscape. I'm amazed at this young boy who envisioned of what the earth looks like from the moon. Who would have thought in 1942 that an Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, would take a copy of this moonscape on the Columbia into space. He was sent, he was 16 years old. He was sent to Birkenau Auschwitz II and murdered. So, um, just to show you how these things start. Jews were being labeled. This is the old story in Europe. It's always the Jews, and today there are other people that have given labels. And it ends in horrible places. Nazi Germany, the newspapers were censored, the lies were spewed 24-7, and those were the times when the lies became the truth. You need to be careful what you buy, you need to filter, and here's Dr. Goebbels. The irony of this, the Nazis did away with all the handicapped people, physically and mentally handicapped people. And you know, Dr. Goebbels was a physically handicapped person. So there was one rule for the others and one rule for the Nazis. And he always boasted this tremendous big job that he did on his radio, newspapers. Jews were depicted. Jews are communists. Documentaries. And eventually the Nazis came out with racial laws in 1935. Germany, the entire population of Germany, numbered approximately 60 million people, and there lived 500,000 Jews. And I think the ones that were smart or had an inkling that something was coming down the pike, over 200,000 Jews left in good time. So Jews were less than half of 1% of the population. So the racial laws were numerous. And the first 
laws that came out, the brown shirts, the Nazi brown shirts of Hitler, they were sent out in cities and towns. They were holding placards. Kauf nicht von Juden, do not buy from Jews. They painted the slogan on their plate glass windows. <clears throat> this was the first boycott against Jews. Jewish teachers could not teach in public schools and universities. Jewish kids could not attend public schools and universities. Jews could only sit on a bench in a park that was marked for Jews. Jews could only shop at seven o'clock in the evening. Couldn't attend theater. Jews were systematically removed from everyday life. <clears throat> the second stage was divestment. Jewish art was taken away, confiscated. The Gestapo came to every home. They knew who had large art collections. These collections were photographed, put into a letter bond book, and was sent to Hitler, and he had the first pick. And what he didn't want went to Marshall Goering. Jewish bank accounts were confiscated. Insurance policies were taken away. Businesses were confiscated. <clears throat> Dentists, doctors, their practices were taken away. And then the sanctions. They put the Jews on trains, sent them out first. They sent them to Buchenwald, Dachau, Sachsenhausen. So I spoke about propaganda, deception. So boycott actually means excommunication. Divestment means expulsion. Sanctions means extermination. This is straight out of the Nazi handbook. I told you about the deception. They wouldn't say that we're going to uh, send you to the east and shoot you in ravines and, or that we would take you to gas chambers and kill you. We will send you to the east. So, and for me and for us survivors, this BDS movement that is so prevalent in North America, in universities, and not only in universities, countries are on board, unions are on board, even the church group is on board here in Canada. I cannot fathom that 70 years after I arrived in Canada, that this democratic country and the universities would bring in a BDS movement used by the Nazis into Canada. And I'm outraged because, you know, you have to remember, you know, in 1939, when the war broke out, 17,000 Jewish teenagers volunteered to fight in, to save Britain, to go to Europe. This was before there was conscription. Tens of thousands of Canadians were sent over the Atlantic to fight this terrible Nazi system. And we now, in our freedom, in our free country of Canada, 
We're using these tools that the Nazis used right here in this country. Have we not learned from the past? You know, it starts with Jews and does not end with Jews. This is not a Jewish problem. And this is where it ends. So, uh, these are young Jews who were liberated May the 6th, 1945, in my camp Ebenze in Austria. And this is what they look like. Skeletons. They were lucky if they had a shirt. I and many others, we were already almost gone. We were barely hanging on by a thread. Had the American units come an hour later, I don't think many more thousands of us wouldn't have survived. So um, let me jump forward a bit, 1941, when the Soviet Union was attacked. The five army units that attacked the Soviet Union, they were called the Wehrmacht. They also had in the line of attack Hungarian and Romanian troops. They were followed by three or four units of Einsatzgruppen, special killing units. As the army went occupy the town, the Einsatzgruppen collected all the Jews in towns, cities, Kiev. And Jews were shot in pits and ravines. You probably must have read a poem by Yevgeny Yevtushenko about a forest, the ravine, called Babi Yar. Tens of thousands of Jews were shot on a daily basis. And you know, the killers kept perfect records. Himmler told these troops, who were all volunteers, many were professionals, that you're going to do this heroic job. You're going to be the biggest heroes of the Reich. But nowhere in the history of the Reich will any, a single word will be written about your heroism. And the order by Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsführer of the SS was, one Jew per bullet, one bullet per Jew. Bullets were very expensive. <clears throat> it was too slow and they were working furiously to come up with a powerful pesticide called Zyklon B gas. A French Roman Catholic priest, the father Patrick de Bois, who published the book, Holocaust by Bullets, I recall when he was in Toronto about four or five years ago, he spoke at the Beth Sedek synagogue, there were a few thousand people there, he spent seven years with a group of interpreters looking for mass graves in the Ukraine, in Belarus, in Ossetia, and Transnistria. He found remains of over two and a half million Jews. All he wanted to do is mark these mass graves that it is a Jewish cemetery. He had to have permission from the mayors of the area or officials of the provinces. Not everybody allowed him to come and look, or try to find these graves. So he was asked, Father de Bois, why did you do this? Seven years. So he quoted from Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, when 
Cain and Abel are working out in the field. Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. God calls to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Abel answers, am I my brother's keeper? He felt that he was his brother's and sister's keeper. This is why he did it. And he said, my job is not finished. I'm convinced there are many more thousands and thousands of remains of people in other mass graves. The problem was that these countries would not allow him to come back and look for these mass graves. We still have in Canada one of these ISIS group. We managed to get to Canada and probably die in his bed. It's iron, ironic that the perpetrators arrived here before the victims arrived in Canada. So this is after liberation by Russian troops. This was Auschwitz, January 27th. I look at these skeletons. This is what the Russian troops discovered. Look at their eyes, they're barely alive. And here's a truckload of bodies, somebody's children or somebody's brother or sister. And here, this SS officer, whose rank has been stripped from his uniform. This is what they found, and more horrible things. And here is a survivor with a tattooed number and a grandchild, or perhaps a great-grandchild, is asking him, I guess, what is that? So I'm a very fortunate person. I have a fourth generation of great-grandchildren. And the oldest one, Yehudit, she has the name of my little sister who was murdered in the Shoah. She asked me, she calls me Gramps. She said, Gramps, what is that blue thing on your arm? So I told her, I said, you know, when you're older, your mommy will tell you where it is. But she says, no, I want to know now. You know, there is no freedom without responsibility. So this is a PowerPoint that I use I speak to tens of thousands of students, high school, university, municipal police, provincial police, Canadian Forces College, every year. And um, this is my story. This is where I come from, Czechoslovakia, a country in Central Europe. It came on the scene in 1919 after the First World War. Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Yugoslavia. These were the three countries that were carved out from the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. And we, Czech Jews, we had 20 golden years in this country. So the makeup of my country was in the West, <clears throat> There were the German-speaking people. It was called the Sudeten part. Bohemia, Moravia were the Czech people. That's where Prague was. In the center were the Slovaks. In the east were the Hungarians. And I come from over here in the eastern part near the Hungarian border. We spoke Hungarian. <coughs> I learned Slovak when I started school at six years old. So the town where I was born was called Moldava in Slovak. In Hungarian, it was called Sepsi. 5,000 people, the Jews were 10% of the town's population. It was a beautiful rural town. 
80% of the population are Roman Catholic. There was a Roman Catholic church. 10% were Protestant. There was a Protestant church. And Jews were approximately 10%. We had a beautiful synagogue. 90 Jewish families with a beautiful synagogue. We had a Talmud Torah, a Jewish Hebrew school. We had a rabbi, we had a uh, shochet, a, a ritual slaughter. He was also the cantor. And we had a Talmud Torah. We had a Malamed, a teacher. We Jews have lived in this part of the world for 1,900 years. Our records in Budapest in the museum, when this part of the world was ruled by the Roman Empire, 150 AD, when Hungary was called Pannonia by the Romans, and Budapest had the name of a quinquem. And my family has lived here for generations. Jews, some were farmers, storekeepers, the most beautiful general store was owned by a family member, my grandmother's brother and his family. It was a beautiful big store. I remember walking into the store and smelling all the spices and coffee and sacks. My father had a distillery. He was making schnapps and schlubovitz and vodka and liqueurs. And he also had a drinking place. It was called a cellar. And actually had to go down steps in the vaulted ceilings. And people came to socialize and have a shot of alcohol. And uh, I lived in a very large house, in a big L-shaped house, with my paternal grandparents. And they had a daughter whose name was Bella, my aunt. She was an invalid. I think she had polio as a child. And all I remember since I was a little child that I knew what was going on. I must have been about a year and a year, year and a half old. I was sitting on the lap of Aunt Bella, who was constantly reading. And um, she taught me to read. When I was six years old, I finished all the books by Jules Verne. Actually, she gave me the love of books, to read books. And you know, my schooling ended when I was 12 and a half years old under the Hungarians. And uh, those, the, those were tough years after the war. And I started to read books. I needed to find out, I needed to learn what the world was all about. So, um, in 1938, my father had a crystal radio. All his friends came to our house. There were only two radios in my town. And my father somehow found out that Hitler was making an important speech from Berlin. And this is a very important speech. It's been documented. <clears throat> and. Um, this poison was pouring out of the radio when Hitler spoke. And I remember a one-liner. We are werden the Juden aus Reddieren. We are going to eradicate the Jews from the face of the world. I was nine years old. I knew that something was going to happen. I didn't know what. I remember the old people. My father was in 38 or 39 years old. All his friends were in their late 30s. When you are nine years old, you think your father is an old man. And they were sort of in shock. And um, in 1938, in fact, Hitler threatened war. And he asked the two democratic countries, Great Britain and France, their prime ministers, to come to this meeting in Munich, it was called the Munich Conference, to decide the fate of my country, Czechoslovakia. 
we Czech Jews, we were in mortal danger. We realized that this is a very serious business. But you know, by 1938, there was nowhere you could run. And there were no countries that would take you in anyhow. So this conference ended by a stroke of a pen. My country was given away on a platter to a dictator signed by two prime ministers, Chamberlain and Delegier. And uh, Chamberlain received a document and he waved it when he came back to London, peace in our time. <clears throat> Chamberlain wrote in his diary, we would not go to war for a country so far away whose name we cannot even pronounce. And Deladier came back to France. The headline in the newspapers was, no war. Hitler wrote something else in his diary. He sized up these two prime ministers and he called them a-holes. You see, these two prime ministers opened the floodgate to the Second World War. Can you think of things like that in our times? Last few years. These were weaklings. Instead of saying, look, if you will touch Czechoslovakia, we will declare war. Maybe history would have been totally different today. The Sudeten part was detached. A few months later, Nazi troops crossed the border, they entered Prague, and Czechoslovakia was partitioned into three parts. <clears throat> Bohemia and Moravia became the so-called protectorate of the German Reich. Heydrich became the protector of that part. It was Hitler's adjutant. And the center of my country became an autonomous country of Slovakia. The leader was a Roman Catholic priest, Dr. Joseph Tiso. And the larger part of my family, my maternal part, were stuck in Slovakia. And we became Hungarians. And after this partition, we Jews from Hungary could not go to Slovakia. They couldn't come to Hungary because we Jews were no longer allowed to cross borders. We were people without any rights. I used to go to my grandmother's big farm every summer. I did that three years in a row. 1938 was the last year. My grandmother's farm, I used to take a train. So a train was always a happy moment in my life. I didn't like school. And you know, the Talmud Torah was not finished by the time the school year ended. I had a difficult time in the Talmud Torah. My mother, she got me out of Dodge, put me on the train, and sent me to her mother and brother's big farm, where I used to meet my beautiful cousins. They came from all over the place in Slovakia, these gorgeous girls. So Hungarians came marching in. They brought with them the racial laws against Jews. These edicts were being posted on a daily basis in different places in my town. The first items were Jews cannot have a bicycle and radio. We had to take it down to town hall. Jews cannot sell alcohol and tobacco. My father's business was confiscated. A neighbor simply walked into my father's establishment and said, I want your key. So these 90 Jewish families, their livelihood was simply taken away from them. This was boycott divestment. A Jewish young man from 18 years to 45 had to report to labor battalions. They were gone for years. My father was gone, my uncle. 
I think we were sort of middle class people. We had a big property, we had a big yard. My grandfather had his big lumber yard. We had a big vegetable garden and acres of fruit trees. And we had chickens, geese, and ducks roaming all over the place. You know, if you saw a fiddler on the roof, you know, Tevye would have been very happy in this type of uh, an environment that I grew up in. Imagine three kitchens in this big house, my grandmother's kitchen, my aunt's kitchen, and my mother's. I was the first grandchild in this big compound here. Jews cannot employ non-Jewish people. My mother had a helper whose name was Anna. And she had to leave, I think it was in 1940. You see, we lived in a beautiful big house. We had a beautiful big kitchen with a beautiful stove, kitchen and dining room, and bedrooms. Each bedroom had a fireplace made from beautiful tiles, a fireplace that was about six feet tall. That was my mother's, and my grandmother's, and my aunt's. So when Anna had to leave, my mother was left doing a lot of the heavy work. We had no running water. We had a well in the yard. And you know, we didn't have gas heating. So my mother had her hands full dealing with three kids. But I had my grandfather. He was the man of the house. Any major decision had to have my grandfather's seal. My grandfather was a big man, a very strong man. He was a non-commissioned officer in the First World War. He fought in the Austro-Hungarian cavalry with all his friends, his buddies who from my town. Every one of these grandfathers in my town, there were about nine of them, they all had the same beard as Emperor Franz Joseph because they would lay their life down for the emperor because the Habsburgs, you know, they emancipated Jews and uh, this is the way Jews paid them back. They revered him. So grandfather was there and I, <clears throat> not liking school, I was doing everything my grandfather was doing. And he gave me the tools to work with. He gave me skills that were so important. Work skills, life skills. He expected me to do whatever I was doing. He said, you've got to be the best at it. And my entire family, my mother, she was really my guardian angel. My uncles, they were farmers, hardworking people. When I look back, this entire family, as if they sort of worked, gave me a map to travel by later on. So I'm 12 and a half years old, Hungarian teachers, are hating the Jewish kids, they're anti-Semites. Jewish kids were told to, uh, we were segregated in the classroom. We were made to sit in the back row of the classroom. Every day there was a big fight. We Jewish kids arrived in school, everybody piled up on us. Big fight every morning. We didn't win many fights, but you know, you had to be your own man. You couldn't have your father or grandfather come and take you to school. You had to do it. And I was 12 and a half. We were thrown out of school. My mother, she didn't want me to sit at home and read books. I was an avid reader of books. She took me away to the capital city of my province, Košice, Kasha. I became an apprentice at 12 and a half, working in a fur shop. You get up at 5.30 in the morning, you walk through the dark streets in the winter to the shop, you clean and sweep, you start the fires, you do the dirty work, and I did that for about three years. 
1942, we received a telegram that said that my maternal family, the Friedman family, my grandmother, my uncles, aunts, cousins, they were taken away and nobody knew what happened to them. Imagine 1942, looking at this map, and the entire map was ruled by Nazi Germany. They called it Festung Europa, the Fortress Europe. Look at this map. Think of all these countries, France, Belgium, Holland, Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece, all the way on the bottom. Think of locomotives pulling thousands of cattle cars all the way to occupy Poland, where there was a large number of Jews, three and a half million Jews. Did the people not know in continental Europe what, who these people were in the cattle cars? Our problem was that we didn't know. And not knowing is a terrible thing. And you know, we survivors, <clears throat> we talk to each other and we say today when we know things and we do nothing about it. That is a million times worse. Not knowing is a terrible thing. So <clears throat> the Friedman family were taken away. Nobody knew where. This Dr. Tiso from Slovakia was the first country that shipped the Jewish Jews out to a terrible place called Majdanek near Lublin. <clears throat> including my family. Dr. Tissot went to see Hitler and he asked him if he needs any young Jews to work in factories. He said, yes, we can use them, but you need to pay 500 marks for each of them because we need to train them how to work. He said, that's not a problem. And he whipped out a document from his briefcase and he said to Hitler, he said, but I want you to sign this document that they will never come back. So the deception, we were devasta <clears throat> devastated. Three months later, a postcard arrived and 10 other families received similar postcards. It had a German eagle on it and it said, general government Poland, that part of Poland was changed, the name was changed to general government. And the stamp said Lublin district. And the message was on the other side, simple message. We, the Friedman family, we are all here together. We are working on farms and we are awaiting your arrival. Remember these few simple lines. Ten other families that were talking to each other. Should we believe this? We had no choice, we had to believe it. That there's some hope and I kept thinking, you know, of my beautiful cousins, my amazing two uncles. That was in 1942. My father and my uncle, these men were allowed to come home once a year for a week to see how the family was doing. 1943, my Aunt Bella died. Her life simply gave out. <clears throat> In hindsight, it was truly a gift from God. I cannot imagine how we would have had to deal with her just a year down the road when all these terrible things hit us. And Aunt Bella, she was truly an angel. She's the only one out of almost 80 extended family members, the only one that has a marker. Today it's only a part of a marker because even the stones were taken out of the cemeteries. There's a little bit of a marker there, a part of her name. 
in the Slovak Republic. The rest of them, there's no markers. Their ashes have been blown to the four corners of the globe. And in 43, my mother gave birth to a little girl. Her name was Yurit. And that was not a good year for a Jewish child and a Jewish mother to give birth. And you know, I think a lot about it, you know, mothers truly had the heavy, heavy burden. Their husbands are away. They have children to look after, a baby. 1944, April the 14th was the first night of Pesach, Passover. It was the Shabbat and it was Passover. And coming from a traditional Orthodox home, you know, weeks before the house was turned upside down, everything was cleaned from bread products and all these amazing dishes that my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt were preparing. And this, we sat down to the Seder, which is, means the order of the dinner. When we tell the story of the exodus of the ancient Israelites. And we eat bitter herbs. My younger brother was asking the questions, why do we eat bitter herbs? So the custom is the father answers. We eat bitter herbs to remember how difficult it is to be a slave and all those who are hungry come and join us at our table. So I see this entire Eisen family. I had many other uncles and aunts who lived in other places. This truly was the last supper for the Eisen family, never to be repeated ever again. We retired about 12 o'clock. The dishes were put away and uh, we knew next morning we'll get up at a leisurely time Know, and we'll go to the synagogue. You see, in Hungary, the Jews were not put into ghettos. We lived in a, in a fascist environment, but we never lacked any food. We still lived in our homes. So we're out in the yard, it's about 12 o'clock at night. My father and my uncle and my grandfather are talking politics. And my grandfather was saying, if we manage to survive another four or five months, we're going to be liberated by the Red Army coming from the East. We knew that the Nazis and the Hungarian fascists, you know, that they were losing the war. And you could see many of the local folks who joined the army, they never came back. Others came back without limbs. We were that close. We didn't know that the gendarmes were being gathered in Hungary to collect the Jews the very next morning. So, you see these Nazis, the fascists, they always did these actions, they called it aktionen against Jews on the Jewish holiday. You know, the Warsaw ghetto uprising was on the day before Pesach, Passover. Hungary was the first day of Passover. Early morning, our gate to our property was kicked down. Seconds later, our bedroom door was kicked in and there were two Hungarian gendarmes in our bedroom yelling and screaming. You have five minutes to pack a bundle. We're taking you away. If you have any money or jewelry, hand it over. Because where you're going, you're going to have no need of this. My mother, being a practical lady, she said to us to put on layers of clothing. My father said, put your winter boots on. These boots were made by a Jewish shoemaker, Mr. Goodman, who always made our shoes. And those shoes truly saved my life. They lasted for a whole year that I was incarcerated. And my father went into the quarters of my grandparents. My grandfather was 77. My grandmother was 75. And this commotion, a neighbor comes running in. Her name was Ilya Klinka, a Christian lady. 
She was a good friend of my mother, her son, and I. We were in the same class. And the gendarmes were yelling at her to get out of here. This is not your business. But she stood her ground. She was a powerful person. And she said to my mother, Ethel, where are you taking this baby? Why don't you leave the baby with me? I can imagine what was going through my mother's head. In 1944, you don't know. Had she left my little sister, would she have survived? There's a good possibility. You know, many Polish Jews before, while the ghettos were being liquidated, they gave their babies to Polish families. Many, many kids were saved. Their parents didn't come back. I'll never know. And we were yanked out, removed from our home, like a bunch of criminals, and 500 Jews were sealed off in two classrooms in the school. And this is where we spent the second night of Passover. It was a terrible night. You don't know what hit you. Imagine old people who were used to the comforts of their homes, their bed. Now you're sleeping on the floor and there's no room. Babies are screaming. Mothers don't know how to feed these kids. So when I came back a year later, this lady, Hilly Klinka, told me of what happened in my town. While we were sealed off, still in town, every single Jewish home was ransacked to the bare walls. In my home, they took out the furniture, everything that was there to the bare walls. The chickens, geese, and ducks were taken away. I had a beautiful, big Alsatian whose name was Farkas. Farkas is a Hungarian name for a wolf. He was our guardian. <clears throat> and she told me, <clears throat> excuse me, that his synagogue was desecrated. The prayer books and the Talmudic books were put in a pyre and torched. The Torah scrolls were taken out of the ark and cut into pieces and worse. Think of it, multiply this by the hundreds of thousands in different towns all over Hungary and all over continental Europe. This was an economic grab, a shameful economic grab. Everybody was happy the Jews were gone. They moved into our properties. Next morning, 500 Jews <clears throat> were gathered in the schoolyard. The exodus of the Jews from my town, we were marched through the town. The townsfolks were on both sides of the road. They were throwing things at us, yelling at us, spitting at us. And I can't say that everyone was there but I know that the majority were there. This truly was an exodus. 500 Jews left. 480 a year later didn't come back. There were only 20 survivors from my town of 500. There was only one mother with two teenage daughters that came back. So we put on a train and sent to Kasha Koshitsa which was the capital city of my province. You see, in 1944, Hungary had 700,000 Jews, the last remnant of Jews in Europe. <clears throat> and these, uh, this brickyard and big yards, are industrial or whatever, were created as a ghetto to hold Jews. It was near a major railroad system. So 30,000 Jews in a brickyard. There is a communal latrine that you can smell for miles away. They put up barbed wire fence. 
There were two taps of water coming in to look after 30,000 people. My mother and other mothers were breastfeeding their babies. They didn't have any milk left. They couldn't feed these babies. And there was a SS officer that arrived in the brickyard and he told us, you know, the lies become the truth. And he told us that you're going to be resettled in the East. Families will be together, you will be working on farms. And he repeated the same thing six, seven days in a row. We couldn't wait to get out of this terrible place. I kept thinking of my beautiful cousins that I'll see them. Remember that postcard two years before, in 1942. I kept thinking that somewhere I'll meet up with them near Lublin. We were put into these cattle cars, about 100 people. Suddenly, the, the military gendarmes arrived and the doors were locked and bolted down. That was a shock. I knew that we were in a box. Initially, they gave us a pail of water and a pail for a toilet. And the train took off. Four nights and three days, or three days and four nights. You cannot sit down, you cannot move around. You are stuck together like sardines in a can. You know, the pail of water was gone in seconds. The toilet pail was full. The doors were never open. Picture of what it smelled like, what it felt like. I couldn't see my mother. She was stuck holding a baby in her arm. Everybody was on their own now. Here you could not support, you could not help anybody because you couldn't move. I couldn't see my two younger brothers. They were stuck between taller people. Two old people died. We couldn't remove the bodies. When the train came to a stop, because the locomotive needs water and coal. We were screaming for water. The doors would never be open. The worst time was the night, pitch dark. And the train is going. You can hear the click, click, click when the steel wheels are hitting the joints in the tracks. And suddenly you hear the whistle of the locomotive when you wake up. And you think you just had a nightmare, only to realize that you're actually living a nightmare. Finally, the came, train came to a stop. And um, I knew that nothing could be worse than what I just experienced. Simply not being able to go to the toilet for four days, you are stuck to this floor. And the door opened and light flooded in and there's a a head wearing a striped cap, and he's yelling at us, Raus Schnell, out fast. And we were yanked out on this platform. We were a bunch of zombies. We didn't know what hit us. The smell of burning flesh. I could see fires behind me. Our welcoming committee were there on the platform, SS units. They had the insignia of the skull and crossbones. This unit was called the SS Totenkopf Division. The SS deadhead units who were in charge of hauling Jews from all points of Europe to the death camps in occupied Poland. There was a selection. Men and women were separated. Any mother who had a baby in her arm simply by the flick of a hand was told to go to the left. They said they're going to be for, they're going for disinfection. Everything was a lie here. My father and uncle and I, we were selected, told to go to the right. I was 15 years old and we were now in the clutches of an SS unit. My mother with the baby in her arm and my two little brothers, my grandparents, my aunt, I was simply walked off, made a left turn, and we knew we were going to meet up the next morning. They wouldn't allow us to take our bundles. They said, you'll have it delivered tomorrow. Imagine all these wonderful services they promised. So they took us to a barrack, 
Our clothing was taken away from us. We're allowed to keep our boots. Our hair was shaved, put to a shower, and from there into a wooden bear to put in bunks. And I remember I was able to lie down on those wooden planks. We were all naked, we had no clothes. And you know, after standing for three days and nights, it felt absolutely wonderful to be able to lie down on wooden planks. I don't know how many hours of sleep I had. It was May the 8th, 1944. The women were processed in the women's camp. Those that were selected for slave labor, their hair was shaved. My mother with her three children, my grandparents, I knew by the next day, they were sent to the left to gas chamber and crematoria too, where 2,000 Jews from Hungary were burned, 2,000 people at a time in a chamber. And I keep thinking of how my mother wanted to save her children. They didn't have a chance. And the uh, SS officers were watching to reinforce portholes, glass portholes, looking at the agony of death of 2,000 people in a chamber. Next morning, uh, we were hauled out in front of the barrack. This is one of the pictures that Ilik Winkler saved. You see, my mother, she fed us a beautiful balanced diet. You see these outfits that we wore? My mother made those outfits. We didn't have a store that you could take off the rack, you know, an outfit like that. This was our summer outfit. And you see our custom-made boots, high lace, shoelace boots. She always made sure that we wore the right kind of shoes so that our ankles would be strong. This was taken in 1938. And this is a picture that was taken in 1940 by the order of the police. So my father was a businessman, my beautiful mother, and Eugene and Alfred. Eugene, he was um, five years younger than I. Everybody knew that this kid was a genius. He never had to worry about homework. He was that smart. Who knows what he would have been if he stayed alive. This is a cattle car that stands on the track in Birkenau, Auschwitz too. We come through this huge guardhouse. There's an opening where the locomotive pushes in any, anywhere from 55 to 60 cattle cars. And see how systematic these Nazis were. They always wanted to have transports about 6,000 people because it had to do with the loading of the gas chambers and the crematoria. Four killing machines. And for, for Hungarian Jews, they put in two extra tracks in 1943. Track two and three. And this is the killing camp, Auschwitz II. So we are standing over here the next morning. We're hauled out in front of the barracks, naked. And I'm looking at this huge layout of hundreds of barracks. And I see four huge chimneys and buildings, fire and flames and smoke coming through. Here's a transport that just arrived. My mother made a left turn, straight ahead and left turn. This is gas chamber and crematoria two. This is where they were taken. Gas chamber and crematoria three, four, and five, and these are pits where Hungarian Jews were being burned. So as we're standing naked, there are two men in the striped outfits. They bring a canister of liquid. We were given some metal dishes, 
They were called Shiso, and they ladled us out a ladle of hot tea. This was the first drink I had in three days. My father asked them, are we going to see our families today? And I said, where did you come from? He said, well, he came from Hungary in the middle of the night. They said, in 1944, you don't know what this place is all about. Your families have gone through the chimney. And you look back at the chimneys, and I keep thinking, how does a person go through a chimney? This was the lingo here. Here that you'll be, you'll die from beating or starvation, but you'll definitely go through the chimney. You were given tattooed numbers and striped outfits. You were no longer a human being, you were only a number. We asked for people who can do farm work and we put up our hands. And a hundred of us were selected and marched down the road to Auschwitz I. This is Auschwitz I. And you see the deception? On top of the gate it says, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free. And there's an orchestra playing music over here, inside the gate. I keep thinking, what is this place? So you are 15 years old and three months, and you are in this camp. There are about 30,000 slave laborers here. I don't know how many languages were spoken here. People are skeletal. I've seen the best and the worst here. The time came when people would kill for a crumb of bread. And you see these trees that are so big, they were about that big when I was there. People would eat the bark of the trees. They would chew their boots, because this is what hunger does to you. Had my father and uncle not been with me, I don't think I would have survived the first two weeks. I remember that first lunch out in the fields that was brought, it stank to high heaven. I said, I will never eat this. My father practically crammed it down my throat. And you know, a few days later, that, taste, that soup tasted pretty good. The trouble was there wasn't enough of it. Our daily diet was 300 calories, a liquid diet, a cup of tea in the morning, there was no water to drink here. The water came from the Sola River and the Wisla and from swamps. So the three morning lunch and our dinner was a cup of ersatz coffee, a thin slice of bread, a tiny square of margarine. And we were worked at 10 to 12 hours of hard labor and you know what it does to your body, you can practically see your body disappearing. And as a slave labor, you have a cap, a jacket, your pants, and your boots. Once your boots are gone, you receive a pair of wooden clogs. And see how you can walk in a pair of wooden clogs, five, six, seven kilometers to the job, and all day working to and fro, and then come back to camp. Your body is in terrible stress. I had the good boots, but you know, I had to wade in into a swamp, the draining swamps. The leather was soaked and wet. During the night, the leather went hard. In the morning, I could hardly put my feet in them. My ankles were swollen, with no socks. My heels were a bloody mess day after day. And you know, here you had to focus and think about your work, how you're going to do it the next day. Here you could not say, I can't do this work. Here there was no time out. You had to be a stuff, you had to have your heart, had to get like a rock. You were dancing on the natural razor blade, the beatings that people were given by the couples. I had a couple of them. You have to be focused and you have to be very resilient. So I remember the map that my family sort of prepared me. It was a wonderful what they did. 
I wouldn't have survived had I not had these skills. Two months later, in July, there were selections. This is July 44, after the Normandy the invasion of Europe. <clears throat> the big German factories, there were tens of thousands of laborers working in big German factories. Women worked in these huge ammunition factories. The Red Army is coming. They're packing up their equipment, sending it back to the fatherland. So we don't have work. We have a selection every night. So imagine you're sleeping the sleep of the dead, and suddenly these powerful microphones, I mean, the loudspeakers are turned on. And as soon as you hear this crackling, you fly right out of your bunk and you hear, Achtung, Achtung. All inmates get out of the barracks, barracks and walk to this barracks so and so naked. And my father and uncle were in a different barrack. I didn't know what happened to them. I managed to survive that selection. But next morning, before we had to march out to work, can you imagine 30,000 people to line up to go to work? On a good day, the count was right. It took about an hour and a half. You had to stand in a military fashion. When the count wasn't right, somebody keeled over, died, and it was shoved under a bunk bed. They had to find the body, bring it down. You could stand there for three hours to four hours. People were dropping dead simply by standing at military attention. This was day after day, the daily diet. So I just want to tell you, achtung, achtung. You know, last July in Toronto, I had my posters of my face beside synagogues in Toronto. Somebody called me that my picture was defaced. Somebody painted a word Achtung on my forehead in Toronto. Who was that being who crawled out from a hole, ambled over on a Shabbat Friday evening, and put this on my face? Oh, people said, well, some crank. I knew he was not a crank. You know, many people, I venture to say, wouldn't even know what Achtung meant. But I know what Achtung means. <clears throat> it took the police a few days before they declared it as a hate crime. And I call this, it's a terrorist act. And I was wondering who is going to stand with us? Are people going to ignore this? Just think of it, how things start and how Jews are depicted in the newspapers in Toronto or on TV. I wouldn't have thought 70 years ago that this could happen in Toronto. So um, I had seconds to say goodbye to my father through the barbed wire fence. My father gave me a blessing, which he did every Friday night when we came home from the synagogue. And he told me, if I manage to survive, I must tell the world what happened here. I was devastated. I knew that this is the end of my family. So I kept thinking, who is going to take care of me? Who can I ask for help if I need to help? Imagine losing your father and uncle. You know, it was different in the women's camp. The women had the smarts. They formed, they formed called Lager Schwester, Lager Sisters, support groups. This was not done in the men's camp. Primo Levi, who was a Holocaust survivor, an Italian Jew, wrote in his book, unless a door opened for you, you could not crawl out of this nether world here. And for me, it was a bad beating that I received from an SS guard, smashed my head in, 
I was, I lost a lot of blood, I went into shock. I was 12 kilometers away from Auschwitz I. I was put on a two-wheeler that carried all the shovels and the pickaxes, brought back to camp. And I was dumped in front of Barrett 21, which was a surgery. People asked me, why did they need a surgery? Well, that was part of the deception the Nazis used. You see, they brought the International Red Cross and showed them, look, we take good care of our people. I was operated on by two Polish doctors. One was a Dr. Rzeszko, he was the chief surgeon, and his assistant was a Dr. Sobieszczanski. They were political prisoners. They were arrested by the Gestapo. I was put up in the ward after the operation. And the story was, if you were operated on, you had two days to convalesce, and then you had to be either out of the hospital, and those that couldn't walk, they were put on, loaded up on trucks and taken to the gas chamber. So it's not very likely that two days after you're going to be able to walk around. So I was loaded on a stretcher with so many others, and as we were going, uh, taking through the hallway in the middle of the barrack, Dr. Rojeshko took me off the stretcher, brought me into the prep room of the surgery, gave me a lab coat, and I became the cleaner, and he saved my life. And I was working in the operating room for the next six months. And it was a totally different ballgame for me. Can you imagine a 15 and a half year old running an operating room? We're operating every day except on Sunday. I think of these two doctors. There were all kinds of doctors there. You know, doctors wear the Hippocratic oath that they will do no harm. And I know that these two doctors, they were operating on people that were torn to shreds. They were trying to put together a body and they worked so hard and they knew that two days later they'll be in the gas chambers. And then there was a Dr. Mengele, who was called the Angel of Death, with his cadre of doctors who were doing experiments on thousands and thousands of twins because he wanted to know how each German woman could have multiple births. And from here they were shipping body parts to every teaching university in Germany and Austria. So, January the 12th, 1945, <clears throat> we knew for weeks. In November, all the four gas chambers and crematoria were blown apart by the Nazis because they knew we could hear the artillery barrage coming from the east. Auschwitz was winding down. When we heard that four gas chambers and crematoria were blown apart, I tell you, I breathed a sigh of relief, but there was many ways to be able to be get killed in Auschwitz anyway. <clears throat> they were burning cards. Anyone that had a tattooed number, the Nazis kept perfect records. There was a saying, Ordnung muss sein, order must be. So January the 12th, about 10,000 of us were pushed out by SS units and their attack dogs. And we started to march. They didn't tell us how long we were going to walk. <clears throat> we left on January the 12th. We arrived in, Bert, um, in Mauthausen on January the 25th. 13 days without a crumb of bread. Thousands of us froze to death. Others simply gave up. So let me come back to Auschwitz for a couple minutes. You see these brave SS men here, you see? Here is a transport that just arrived. Think about it, these people were in a cattle car for days. Men and women are separated. And they are standing there very relaxed, it's like everything is okay. They say if you can't walk, we have Red Cross trucks in the back. We'll take you there. So uh, think of two SS guards 
I was a witness for two SS guards that were standing on the platform when Hungarian Jews were delivered here. You know, in a span of three months, May, June, July, and part of August, 450,000 Hungarian Jews were gassed here in the last year of the war. Do you think the Hungarians could have protected us? Of course. So one of the guards in 2015, his name was Oskar Gröning. He was called the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. And there's a documentary out. I have a small part in it. It's called The Accountant of Auschwitz. He was being charged with being an accessory in the murder of 300,000 Hungarian Jews, simply because he was on the platform. Oskar Gröning carried the loot Every bundle that Jews brought with them, their clothing, was taken to barracks called Canada. Everything was examined and torn to pieces. Bread or buns, people would bake in a gold coin. People would stitch in currency in the shoulder pads of their jackets or in the hems of dresses. The Nazis were determined to find everything that these people brought with them. The bodies that were gassed, the ones that they thought may have gold crowns, they were put on a slab, and the bodies were torn apart. The gold crowns and fillings were taken out. People would hide some jewelry inside their body. The gold would be melted down in bricks, the gold bricks. And Oscar Groening was taking the loot in a metal suitcase two or three times a week to the Reichsbank in Berlin. And here's Oscar Gröning, a proud SS man at 96 years old. He said, I was there. I saw it, I heard it, I smelled it. I simply followed orders. I wasn't part of the killing machine. And here is his buddy, his comrade, Reinhard Hunning, you see the death head unit, this skull and crossbones. He said in court, never looked at a witness, never uttered a word. Oscar Gröning said terrible things. Oscar Gröning was asked, well, what did you do on the platform? He said, well, as you imagine, the people are taken away from the platform and there's 50 pounds of goods piled a pile in front of every cattle car, 60 piles. And the inmates would pile it on big trucks. They would take it to Canada, to the barracks of Canada. And he said, we had to watch them because those people were crooks. They were stealing from the bundles. Can you imagine? They were stealing from the bundles. What were they stealing? A piece of bread? You see, stealing was a terrible crime. But to gas people by the hundreds of thousands, that was okay. He said, he was asked, um, our lawyer was a, actually a German judge. His name is Thomas Walter. He's a, he's a judge for 30 years. So he asked Oscar Gröning, but what about the children? He said, yeah. He says, you don't understand. It's because of their Jewish blood. That's why they have to be killed. So they won't contaminate. He was asked, did a Jew had a chance to live a life? He says, absolutely not. You know, we thought that he will say something, forgive me or whatever. The other guy, Reinhard Hunnick, you see, when we were in the camps, when we were stopped by an SS guard, we were not allowed to look in his eyes. How dare a Jew look into the eyes of an SS man? We had to look down on the ground, whip up our cap, stand at a military stance, and say, number A9892, report. And while we were giving witness, Reinhard Hunnick, would not look at a single Jew while he was there, while we were there. 
So the judge, Anki Gruda, really downloaded on him, and he said, you know, anyone that wore the criminal outfit of the SS was part and parcel of the killing machine. So um, they both received 40 years. They appealed, they both died last year. So um, the killers were their own archivists and bookkeepers. Today, there are many people who say the Holocaust never happened. They kept perfect records. These are documents that are sitting in the museum in Auschwitz, in the archives. You see tattooed numbers, names. The numbers, the tattooed numbers change to eight. These are Hungarian transports, eight. My father, 9891. My number is 9893, and my uncle. And this is what happened to them on July the 9th. This is a document sent to the SS Hygiene and Bacterium Department. These people were experimented on by the biggest pharmaceutical companies. These companies today are world beaters. They were asking for another shipment to produce drugs for Septicaucus hemolyticus never to be seen again. And these were the women. Their heads were shaved and they came in a sandal. Imagine how long a sandal would last here. I saw women who were pulling a big cement roller grading a road. The road, the stones were covered with blood. The women, when they found a piece of rag, they could cover their head. These were the Zondir Commando. These were the units that did this terrible job getting rid of the cadavers from the gas chamber to the ovens. These were Jews who were picked 600 at a time. There were three ships going every 60 days. They were rotated, they were gassed because they never wanted anything to get out of here. There was a Greek Jew who managed to survive his name was David Olaire, and he sketched these things that he saw. He worked here in the, as a Zonder Commando. So, <clears throat> this is the operating room where I worked for six months. January 27, this is the Red Army arrived in Auschwitz. This is what they found. And this is the Red March. We left Auschwitz in January the 12th. Dresden, Pilsen occupied Czechoslovakia, arrived in Mauthausen, May the 25th. From Mauthausen to Malk, from Malk to Ebensee. I arrived in Ebensee at the beginning of April 1945. There was no work, of course. I mean, the German Reich was finished. You know, you simply look at this map in 1945. They're taking Jews from the east, bringing them to different camps in Austria and Germany. You know how many thousands of SS men were employed here and their officer corps? They simply walked themselves home from the Russian front to their homes in Austria and Germany, these SS men and their officer corps. And they said, well, we are busy people. We have to watch these Jews. And they killed us on the road. And this was Liberation Day, May the 6th, 1945. Those that could still stand up. So I was suffering from typhus. I was in a lower bunk. I was at the end of my life, and um, I could get up. Somebody shoveled in in his wooden clogs into the barrack, and he was mumbling away that the guards are not in the tower. Imagine SS guards with machine guns and searchlights. And I, something told me that I need to crawl out from my bunk. I had to crawl over cadavers all over in the barrack. I'm 
in front of the barrack on the ground and I'm looking, I see that there's a white flag flying on the gate. And the big tank, the gate just flew in and the tank is coming through with a white star on it and black soldiers are sitting on the turret. That was quite a moment to know that the SS is gone because I knew that the Reich was finished, but I also knew that they'll kill us all before they, I didn't know what they were gonna do, run away or whatever, but I knew that they would kill us. These soldiers were in total shock. I will never forget that. I met up with Johnny Stevens, he was a squadron commander, he was a sergeant. They were operating on Jan Patton's third army. They came through the Battle of the Bulge. They never saw a camp like this. So they liberated ABC, Gunskirk and Mauthausen. And this is Majdanek in Lublin today. Uh, this picture was taken a couple of years ago. You see, the Nazis shipped everything to the fatherland, clothing, gold from the mouth of, they were watchers, they desecrated dead bodies. And the bottom, the last line in this document called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Nothing will be wasted. Even the ashes will be sold as fertilizer. Well, you know, human ashes, 70 years, 74 years later, this is how green the grass is when you go there to Majdanek or in Birkenau in April. And I always keep thinking, these must be the spirits of these people that were murdered here. They're looking at us and they're trying to send a message. You know, in Majdanek there's a big urn here This was built by the Polish government after all, post-war. Inside there is a mound of ashes and bone chips. You always have a memorial service here. And it's chiseled in into the face here in Polish. And the message is from us to you, beware. So I'm liberated. I'm not well. There were more people dying after liberation. Imagine the irony that we were dying from starvation. When the Americans gave us food, it killed us. Our bodies could not retain protein. Protein was killing us. We had to be fed with an eyedropper. Who could have do that? <clears throat> I was determined to come home months later I was walking about two kilometers. I had a ride with a farmer. And I was walking towards my home. This is my home, a big L-shaped house, a big long L, that's the leg, and this is the body. We lived in the front part. There was a big fence here and a big gate. My grandfather's lumber yard was here. The orchard was in the back, and I Googled this whole thing. It's on Google today. I went back in 1993. There's a big scrapyard here. Oops, oops sorry. Um, and there were people working in the yard. I came back with a friend of mine from the same town. And the manager was a lady. And I told her who I was. And she looks at me and says, oh, did you want to come in to see the house? And I'm looking, all our windows were opening. On the inside of the house, there's a porch running along the full length. All the windows and doors open there. And all the windows are metal bars. It looked to me like a prison. I'll never forget this. Oh, she says, we have to put the metal bars on the windows because the gypsies are stealing all the parts. The irony, you know, the Jews, they've done away with, you know, there's still the gypsies there, the Roma. So uh, <clears throat> I said, no, I don't want to go in. I just want to walk into the garden. We had a huge orchard. We had beautiful plum trees. And uh, my wife said, don't go back. 
You should never go back. You always need to go forward. And I keep thinking, what am I doing here? And the big Tatra car, which is made in Czechoslovakia, an eight-cylinder car, drives in. Three men in business suits get out, and they're all huddling together with my friend, and I'm walking back from the orchard. The trees have grown to, went wild, broke my heart. And I hear in Slovak, she's telling him that this man was born here in this house. So they look, and he turns back to this lady, and he says, Yet or jet? Is he a kike? You know, a kike is like an N word. Jet means a derogatory way of saying a Jew. And I can hear it because I understand Slovak. I keep thinking, what the heck is going on here? So I walked up to him, I said, Yes, I'm a Jew. I could smell the vodka on his breath. He says to me, do you want to buy the house? I said, no, this is my house. You know, there was no point in arguing, so we just got out. We went into town. My friend Gavida had a beautiful house and they had two stores in the front. One store, they, was, they were selling beautiful chocolates and exotic fruits. So there's two stores there now, uh, children's, men, uh, children's clothing and a children's shoe store. So we went into one of the stores and he says, I'm Gabi Lichtman. Oh, we bought the house 30 years ago from the government. Went into the shoes, oh, we bought the house 30 years ago. It was a terrible thing to go back. Of course, there's not a single Jew living there. And you know, I think this town, went backwards about 200 years. It's not the same town. So I wound up in a yeshiva, which is the school of Jewish studies, in, after the war in, outside Prague in a place called Marienbad, which is a world famous spa. And there were about 35 of us. And uh, <clears throat> in 1948, overnight, this beautiful democratic country, Czechoslovakia, was again taken over by a communist putsch in the middle of the night. President Benesch was arrested. They took over Radio Prague. They arrested the chiefs of staffs and the heads of the Democratic Party. We turned on the radio the next morning. We were in a communist country. And we knew we had to grab our backpacks and move on. But we were caught, six of us. I thought that this was it. Anyway, I got out of that one. And um, I arrived in Quebec City, October the 25th. So um, this is my fourth generation. Uh, <clears throat> this is Yehudit. She's 10 years old now. She has the name of my little sister, Yudit. This is Elisheva. She is quite a card. Funny little thing. She's eight, and this is Mikhail. And they live in Jerusalem, and they live in Ir Shalom, which is, means the city of peace. I hope so. How lucky I am. And this is my story, my book. And I just want to tell you after my book was launched in 2016, I had a phone call from New York. He says, my name is Josh Eisen. He said, I picked up this book on Amazon. He says, we are cousins. He says to me that his grandfather and my grandfather were brothers. And uh, I didn't know that my grandfather had any siblings. I knew his grandfather, who also emigrated to the States. So. Six siblings of my grandfather, four boys and two girls, emigrated to the United States in 1919. But Josh's grandfather, after living for 10 years in New York, went back to Hungary. He bought a winery. This is in the wine region of Hungary, the Tokai region. And he was murdered in Auschwitz. But his wife and three daughters and the son survived. It was truly a miracle. And they came back to Hungary. They were American citizens, and they went off. I never knew about this. 
So Josh arrived with a family tree, and a year later we had a gathering of the Eisens in Manhattan, 98 people, there were three, in some cases four generations there. An amazing story. So um, my great-grandfather must have been a very smart man. He knew that his children have, don't have much of a future in this place. He told them to go to the new world to make their fortune. And we found my great-grandfather's stone in the Slovak Republic. The lettering is all in Hebrew, and his name is Tzvi Yaakov, and uh, I know because my father's brother had his name. My, my uncle's name was Tzvi Yaakov. And this is not the cemetery. The cemetery was moved, and they have a soccer field over the cemetery, and there's a few stones left in a corner. And this is the only stone that stands upright. Many cemeteries in Europe, the stones are gone or broken, and this stone is standing. So um, this is what the Al said. So I think my message is that what is going on here now, it is serious business. <clears throat> this BDS movement is a big threat. Don't take it from me. Google Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the ex-chief rabbi of Great Britain. He made a speech in the European Parliament in Brussels last year about the BDS movement. So um, I think we have come to an end here. So I don't know whether there's any questions or whatever. So you know, this was my second time in Winnipeg. I want to thank you for so much for giving a voice to those voices that were extinguished, to the millions of voices of our people. But also, you provided a voice for every one of us, for all of the students that you spoke to yesterday and the thousands of students that you continue to speak to, to make them understand how important their voices are to speak out against injustice, against anti-Semitism, against racism. And we have a few gifts for you, but I want to share with all of you a little secret. Tomorrow is Max's 90th birthday. And in addition to our personal gifts to you, today, a teacher from Kelvin High School came to deliver this. Her students insisted on writing you birthday messages. Right. You. And she wanted to tell me how very impressed, how moved they were by your words. And they wanted to express that personally. So here are their messages. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. <laughs> And I know that uh, all of us join together in wishing you Admea uh, Ve'asrim bis hundred and zwanzig until 120, the traditional uh, Jewish wish on a birthday. And thank you so much to all of you for coming. Max's book is out there. He'll be happy to sign it. And please help yourself to refreshments as well. Thank you very much. And good night.